everybody pops. I don't know if you're there yet. There's a bit of blatant advertising while I'm around waiting. My friends made me these. They're good, aren't they? They're really lovely. They're really fine. So, it says I'm live now. So I'm doing some blatant free advertising. Thanks to Ruby and her beautiful, wonderful group. So, and we'll be if anybody joins us. Um, so my talk. Hi, Danielle. I've got one whole person. Thank you very much for turning up. You are awfully kind for that reassurance. Thank you very, very much. Can you hear me okay? I feel like I'm being a bit quiet today. It's because I'm a little bit scared. Anyway, so I do hope that people will um, comment and get involved. Um, I will try and keep up with the comments. I have got you on a big screen, so hopefully I'll be able to do that. So um, I'm here to do a little bit of <laughs> I'm here to do a little bit of um, self-management, I guess. Um, hi, Ruby. I suffer from anxiety. You know that I think that's fairly common in dog trainers, from what I can tell, and it does affect my life. And one of the things that it can do is really allow <laughs> she's connected me to a telly that's nice so you get to sit on the sofa and everything you lucky toad i'm sat in my office chair yeah I, I maybe could have set it up in my living room i'll think about that next time if you invite me back again so the guilt of the methods that i've used in the past remembering actually while you're judging me if you feel that you do need to judge me that I'm over 50 years of age. Um, you may be able to tell by the uh, the delightful highlights. Uh, I've given up dying. So I've had a lot of time to get the experiences um, and the exposures to other training methods that perhaps some people watching won't have done. Now I did do that little poll earlier and it turns out it's about 50 50-ish. I, I was going to sit down and work it out, but I didn't. Uh, it's about 50-50-ish for people who've never used punishment-based training and people who are crossover trainers like I am. Um, so I think that's amazing. So for the first, one reason is I kind of thought I'd be coming on here and everybody would have been force-free right from the very beginning. And that would have made me feel even guiltier. But I'm glad to see that there are other crossover trainers, so I feel like I'm not alone. But I'm even gladder to find out that now we have people who can honestly say that they've never used it, that they've never had to be there. I think that that makes my heart sing, and it really does. So why, why did I fall into this pit of honestly believing that you had to punish a dog? Well, remembering my age, remembering where I originally came from, um, it was quite normal when I was a child to um, what was the spare the rod and ruin the child or something like that. You know, punishment was normal. It was normal in school. We were threatened with physical punishment. Um, if we did anything wrong, we were sent off to the headmaster to, uh, you know, depending on the headmaster, it would be a slipper that you were smacked with or it would be a cane um, or a ruler across the hands. Yeah, it was normal. It was, it was part of our upbringing and it was part of our home bringing as well. You know, you, um, you wouldn't dare to swear or say anything wrong uh, because you would expect to, to get some um, physical punishment as a result of it. So my first, very first dog was a family dog and, and we got her when I was four years of age. And I witnessed the same 
you know, raising techniques as were being um, put on to us, being put on to this little dog. And at the time, I, th I think even as a four-year-old, I think I did recognize that it was wrong. But at the same time, that's your, that's your model, isn't it? That's your social model. That's the person who you're going to follow and believe that that's the way it should be. Luckily, my mum wasn't that way, so there was a, a, a settling effect um, in the home that she kind of taught us there is another way. But I think that that exposure, we are, after all, we're the product of our upbringings, of our exposures and our, our lives, just as dogs are, you know, that we're going to be, our, our view of the world is going to be formed by that. Um, and equally going along my young adult life as I got other dogs um, I saw the same until I moved out of home and took with me a dog who I'd got a few months just before I left and he was a street dog he'd come in he was sort of latchkey dog because that was quite normal as well when I was uh, 16 17 18 he came with me I'd taken him to my first official person, dog trainer. I found a dog trainer. Somebody else had suggested that I go there. I knew nothing about dog training at all um, at the age sort of 17, 18, and other than what I'd known at home. And we walked into this dog training place and we were told we had to put a choke chain on the dog because, you know, he was a young adolescent male. He'd been used to living out on the street and doing as he liked and didn't have any understanding of having to follow what people say um, and the dog trainer's advice was put this on him and she actually gave me one and then showed me how to use it um, and I guess at that point you would imagine that a person would think to themselves this is wrong and I think the part of myself did but at the same time, this was the dog trainer. You know, this was the person who should know, should know. And it did work. You know, my dog who was messing about and playing up and barking and, and um, acting aggressively towards the other dogs in the class suddenly started doing as I said. So, you know, it was working. I carried on with it. And when I moved out with him, um, I moved into my first job as a veterinary nurse, learning and training to be a veterinary nurse, where, rather sadly, the um, dominant theory was strongly believed in. You know, we would, um, the vets there would demonstrate how to pin the puppy down and to force the puppy to, um, and again, it was accepted knowledge at that point. It, you know, none of this is, is meant to be a dig at anybody, it's just it was how it was and bad dogs but you know there was none of this um, an aggressive dog can be rehabilitated it was bad dogs got put to sleep so it was common during my first few years as a, as a trainee veterinary nurse to see dogs being brought in young adolescent dogs being brought in to be put to sleep because they were biting and you know and again massive amount of guilt that I was involved with that because I didn't know any better um, the turning point, actually, was when I got into working at uh, a different veterinary practice. When I, I moved to Birmingham, I was working in a referral practice, and they handled the animals completely differently, which was really shocking to me. And of course, I'm going to go with flow because I really liked it. I'm like, what do you mean we don't have to do this and we don't have to? You mean we can just be gentle? with them and kind with them. Complete mind blown that we didn't have to force any of this onto the animal. And of course then I want to know more about how I can, this dog who's gone with me and has already gone through this horrible experience of living with me and being trained in that way, I wanted to change. But I had no idea how to do it. I, you know, didn't have an access, access I was in a brand new um, place, didn't know anybody locally, um, didn't even know where to start. 
so I, I went off and started trying to find knowledge and information and started to um, attend conferences and speak and see speakers and whatever and one of the first ones um, and I is was Ian Dunbar and reading books um, that he'd suggested um, which was is, is amazing to me and and I know a lot of the the information there has now become outdated and those of you that are younger and are studying it now you're going to see people saying oh Ian Dunbar this and Ian Dunbar that and uh, well the thing is you've got to put it into context of where it all started um, and it was it was amazing to me so when I finally came home with Jet who was my first personal dog who traveled with me on that journey into to Birmingham and back again um, I would say he was my very best friend as a result of me changing. The changing from one to the other was quite hard and I was still very much learning so I can't say I was doing it perfectly. Um, and when he finally left me, um, I went looking for a Border Collie. I said I want a Border Collie. I want to learn more and I want a dog that's going to want to learn. You know, and I, I challenged myself. I want to do this. I want to have this dog that can learn stuff and this, in my um, again not very knowledgeable mind at that time um, a border collie was the pinnacle and I got one I got a rescue collie who came to me I was interviewed by border collie rescue for two and a half hours because they wanted to make sure that I was going to be capable of um, dominating this border collie puppy who was already a biter um, so I had to kind of lie that I was definitely going to force him to listen to me and I wasn't going to let him get away with anything. And remembering that I still haven't at that point completely changed over, I'm still trying to learn, still trying to find my way. I made a lot of mistakes with him and I took him to a dog trainer who unfortunately at that point was still... Um, I would say if you were going to define it, I would say she was a balanced trainer. She did allow you to have food and she did encourage you to use food and praise, but she also very much encouraged us to use chains and to, you know, and again, made sure we knew how to use them properly and the timing of it. And, um, and he didn't do well with all of that. He didn't do well with all of that at all and actually ended up biting. Um, significant bites on a couple of people um, and that I think was actually the proper turning point when I realized I this isn't I can't do this I can't I can't be um, punishing my dog it's not it's not working and I that, that's when I properly dug in and started learning about using only um, reinforcement based training and started really learning about you know how to do it so clicker training loved it loved it loved it turn this dog around completely by making him feel safe by giving him a voice by allowing him to tell me when situations weren't good and absolutely realized at that point that why doesn't everybody know this why 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 have i only just found out why wasn't there somebody there to tell me and to help me and to bring me into this knowledge and that's when the little spark started to grow I want to be that person I want to be that person that changes somebody else's way that they're going to deal with it but I have to say I recognize how long it took from those bits of knowledge kind of floating around and being presented to me to them actually taking seed and growing and, and starting to change my behavior. And that really, I keep that in the back of my mind. Every time I'm dealing with a client, I keep in the back of my mind, I can give you this information, I can show you how to do this, but that isn't just gonna go in and just grow straight from there. Um, it's, it's gonna take a while. And I think if we're not gentle with our clients and, and keep encouraging and helping them, then 
they they can so easily be swayed to what looks like a quick fix and that's that's the problem that we're having obviously with tv programs and social media access to quick fix type training it's still there so and i find very much you have to be very very careful with social media because there are people coming who are looking to learn but are, don't have the knowledge to use the right um, language or, or you know to express how they're feeling they don't even know that they can and we could very easily push them away we could very easily make them not feel invited to learn and to join and I know that it's really hard when you know that somebody is coming into your class with a choke chain or whatever horrible bit of kit you were rather they were not using but if you just tell them that straight away you're liable to cause them to feel threatened to feel like they need to escape from that situation so you need to be really gentle with them um, and while you're standing on your soapboxes for anybody that, that does, remember that wherever you are in your learning curve, there's further to go because the knowledge doesn't stop. The knowledge is changing and growing. The science is changing and growing. Science isn't truth. Science is just hypotheses that have either been proven or disproven. And that depends on where we are at the time. So I've got this, I've printed this off, because if you haven't seen this, you need to know about it. The Dunning-Kruger effect. Basically, the level of confidence that you have in your knowledge is generally, to begin with, higher as your competence in that subject is lower. Okay? I'm about to start on my way up this curve now. Having done the masters and again having my brain emptied, we were warned when we started the masters at Lincoln, we were warned you are going to hit bottom when you realize that you know nothing. And it's true. It's true. When you realize that there's so much more to know and that you've got to keep pushing and pushing to get that information. Um, and it's so much easier to fall back into accepted information. It's so easy to expose yourself to the things that are on social media. So be careful that you don't become so tied up in your, your joy that you have this information and you want everybody to know it that you push other people away. And then also accept the fact that as much as you know, there's a whole lot more to know. So, um, what do I love about the, the knowledge so far, the stuff that we've got going on at the moment? The fact that if we focus on behavior, we're missing the point. I love, I love this new acceptance of animals as emotional beings. It's the biggest thing for me that, that instead of focusing on the behavior we can entirely focus on the emotion that we are no longer going to be made to feel foolish or, or wrong or stupid when we use anthropomorphic terms that we are allowed to compare the behavior of our teenage dogs to the the behavior of a teenage human or, and that, we, that by doing that, we are not in any way lessening their species-specific behaviors. We're not taking any value away from them as being the animal that they are. We're, we're actually accepting that in a lot of ways, they're more intelligent than us. You know, they've got skills that we are never going to have. They're always going to be able to find us much more easily than we can find them if they go missing. You know, there, there are jobs that the dog's going to always be better prepared for than we are. And that training, training isn't so much about 
making your dog do stuff. It's not so much about having a dog who will because you say they should. It's about finding ways of having the dog want to. It's about finding ways of having that dog join in with you and join up with you. And it's about making sure, not just that the dog is able to fit into your home and your life and your society, but that that dog has access to things that do it for them, things that make them happy, things that make them fulfilled. And, and this, all of this, I absolutely love. And somebody somewhere uh, recently commented on the fact that they don't even bother training their dog anymore. And, I, and, I, and actually, I'm starting to think that I might be starting to go down that route. That's a little bit scary from the point of view of how do you teach a client not to train their dog? <laughs> yeah. So, um, more about managing situations, more about social connection, more about them learning that they can be with us and we're safe to be with and that we're fun to be around, not being so um, sort of prescribed in our methods. But that that that's that's going to be a brain twister of how to explain that to clients. So for now. For now, I'm going to continue teaching clients to be cookie pushers, and those ones that want to know more, I'm going to I'm going to bring them that way with me because I don't want to constantly be nagging at my dogs. You must do this. You must do that. They learn by the consequences. They really do, and they learn that staring at the treat cupboard makes me go there, whether I want to or not. I'm pretty sure dogs. Uh, able to use brain worms you know they, they get that idea into your head and then they just keep reminding you that they they it's actually it's treat time and the cupboards there you know if you just happen to go past it you could just get new treats um, and constantly communicating with us if we learn how to read them if we learn how to understand them does that make me perfect no because I know there's a hell of a lot more to learn and I know that as I as I start to think that perhaps I know everything, it's going to change. Something new is going to come out. And you know, I'm, I, my dream, I guess, would be at some point somebody actually does come up with a universal translator and I can start actually hearing my dog's um, communications in real life. I mean, that, God knows, it's changed. Everything's changed so much with technology and whatever it might happen, might it? Can you imagine? Although I have a sneaking suspicion that what I might actually hear is, um, can I have another treat? What about now? Could I now? What about now? And I think that there might be a um, slightly nagging voice. Um, and I definitely know that there's going to be an awful lot of, you really ought to get off the sofa and stop watching that TV program and take me out for a walk because I need to go out for a walk now, actually. Anyway, so let's have a look at some of these. Is there any questions or comments that we can talk about for you? Um, Sean, I'm a crossover trainer, eight years. Um, no one should be judging anyone for doing things, learning better and then consequently doing better. Yeah, the more you know, the better you do. Is Absolutely. Um, and Ruby says, I think the majority of, of are riddled with it not just the older generation that used compulsion based methods grew up around police dog trainers and even there though even there the the reward based methods are being starting to be recognized and things are starting to change um i've got my friends uh, got an ex army dog it was a dog that actually worked on on you know in 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 the nasty places um and he's mostly positively trained he mostly works for, you know, I know that they, they still do have to, to a degree, force the dog into situations that the dog would rather not be in and the dog has to accept that. But it is changing, it's changed massively. Um, a board rubber, did you get a board rubber thrown at you, Ruby? Um, I, so Bentley and the holistic dog grooming, I feel guilty. I feel I actually traumatized my dog by seeing a dog trainer who used forceful methods. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I couldn't agree more. 
Um, punishment based never sat right with me, but I thought if the police did it, exactly. Exactly. And, and it's what we're exposed to. And, and I think the other thing is to actively choose not to expose yourself to it. So I get a little bit sad when I see people going on and I know it, it puts people backs up and they want to comment on it, but the fact that you've watched a TV program that's made you angry means you've exposed yourself to that and you're allowing those seeds to be planted in your brain and that we need to get it out there. We need somehow to make it more accessible to owners so that owners can know that, you know, there are better ways. And, you know, I've still got hopefully 20 years that I might be able to make a difference with that. Um, when I had my prayer lot, when I had my Labrador, I knew nothing about training methods and just did as I was told. Yeah, absolutely, by family. And family are a massive pressure, you know, especially if you've got an older gentleman. That's not very fair. I take that back. But if you've got somebody in the in the home that is, that's how they were taught and that's how they brought their dogs up. They're going to find it really difficult and they do find it really difficult to accept that their younger generation are using a different method. Um, uh, let's have a look what else. My Moo has never known what it's like to be shouted at. Ah, do you know what though? Because I'm a bit quite a loud person, especially when I get stressy with my anxiety, I can get shouty and horrible. So I train my dogs <laughs> to um, think that it's hilarious when I shout. Um, so when I get shouty, I train shouty and, and pull faces up and things and then scatter treats around so that when I am getting in that condition, they kind of go, oh, she's on one again. You know, they, they kind of know it's okay. Um, ooh, who else? Let's have a look. Karen, I last used a check chain in the 90s because it wasn't producing the required result. I discovered a tug toy. Oh, brilliant. Um, and, that, and that's where I, I did actually end up going with Jet as well, finally realising that finding a motivator that worked for him was all I really needed to do. Um, but guilt, absolutely. Well, you're going to have to get a guilt gang going. Um, when I got my first dog, I was told to pin her down. I know. I'm sorry if I was one of the people that was involved or, or was someone similar. You know, we didn't know. We didn't know that we were teaching you wrong. Positive trainers can be really harsh too. Oh, you're not wrong. Um, yeah, I think that's the thing, you know. We can, because we're, we're especially crossover trainers, I think, you just, it's a bit like being an ex-smoker, I'm an ex-smoker, um, and you see people smoking and you just want to slap them and take the cigarette out of their mouths and stuff. But that's not going to make them give up smoking, that's going to make them cling on to them even harder. Um, but yeah, I think we do have to be very careful. Um, yeah, love them, love those owners, even the, even the grumpy ones, even the ones that come in with the chow chains and their, their dogs, you know, if you lose that person, you lose the ability to help that dog. So you need to get that person on your side. You need to find a way of gritting your teeth and being ever so nice to them while you demonstrate what you'd like them to do. Um, Stephanie, what you say? Yes, I agree. We need, I think, a responsibility to teach people a better way. Um, yeah. And the inviting, I think you're right, the inviting amongst trainers, we need to find a way of, of just not getting involved. And, it, and Because the more we fight, the more we give them the voice, the more we give them an opportunity to, to put us down and to get angry with us um, and to build up people that believe. What we need to do is prove it. We need to get out there somehow and prove that you don't need to be horrible to your dog. You can have a really, really nice friendship and a good, nice relationship with your dog and teach them how to live with you and how to feel safe with you. Um, it's been used on horses, don't get me on the subject of horses. I, I can't ride anymore. I, I grew up um, riding from being seven I was in the saddle. Um, but especially since doing the Masters, the idea of putting a, a bit into a horse's mouth now just makes me cringe. And until it becomes 
either I'm able to train my own horse and afford my own horse, which let's face it, dog trainer, not going to happen. Um, I don't think I could find myself riding again unless I've got a friend who who trains the horse, um, you know, in a gentle way. But um, so where are we? Da, da, da. It's been used on horses. They had a device that allows communication. Ooh, Simon, tell me more. Um, my young niece and nephew love dogs but watch these horrible shows and I know and it's scary you know because if kids are trying to do the same they're gonna get they're gonna get got they're gonna get bitten because you know oh don't it's not funny is it it's horrible um Amanda hi Amanda Amanda one of my my compatriots my lovely lovely huggy person that I did the masters with god I miss her and her Constant, constantly going on about her great big dogs. Yeah, I love it. Um, showing your dogs all sides of you because nobody's perfect. Although <laughs> throwing the treats around after I've got stroppy, or pretended, you know, when I'm training, training them to accept me when I'm stroppy. Um, yeah, because I know I'm going to get like that because of the anxiety, and I, 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 you know, I'll start bashing about the house and having a complete cleaning frenzy and, and rushing into them and knocking them out of the way and it's not that's not what I'm like in real life but I need them to know where I am going to be like that sometimes um, so I'd rather that they learn to, to get used to it I don't want them to be afraid of me um, Oh, Amanda Lawrence, useful method for, yeah, yeah, absolutely, and maybe who is behind me snoozing, my little, my little old girl is about to turn 14, she is amazing with my autistic nephew, my, he's non-verbal, he, he's huge, he's, he's like six foot two, six foot four, and, and big, and maybe he's just so cute with him, they communicate on a level I've never seen between even really good dog trainers and their dogs. Jed is non-verbal, but she understands everything. She understands exactly what he means. And I want to believe that he understands what she's kind of communicating. Now, we don't leave them together alone, so don't worry about that. With where his mom and me, my sister, are there watching them both like hawks and ready to intervene, but they're, they're just... They're so funny, and and when he tells her that he's finished, he just does his little hand signal, and she's like, "All right." And I've watched them share cereal bowls, you know, big. He's this big bloke, and he's sat on the on his sofa, and he's doing his spoon, and then he'll offer her the bowl, and then he goes, "No, it's mine," and he has a bit more, <laughs> and she sits back. They're just so sweet together, and that. It's never been trained. It, we monitored them really, really carefully, and we interrupted. She'd interrupt her son, and I would interrupt my dog until they they formed this communication. Um, but yeah, I think no no real training. Yeah, just learning to understand each other, just learning and developing a bond together. Um, and when Jed was little, and I was starting to learn all these different methods of teaching dogs I started to say to her look is there anything like this with regards to training autistic kids and at the time there wasn't so when <laughs> we decided and, and we did train him like a dog and it did work we used positive reward based training methods which had never been used at that point and now my sister with no qualifications whatsoever with regards to childcare because of her son experts come to her to ask her opinion on how to get round stuff which i think is amazing you know amazing she's never been to school properly you know she left school early because she had an early pregnancy but um yeah so and again i don't i don't think you have to be qualified to be able to be an expert in something i think you do have to though chase that knowledge and remember that you don't when you start to think that you're actually an expert, you're probably 
so watch yourselves if you start to think you really know it all you're probably at the wrong end of that curve double check yourself so i'm kind of um i'm feeling all right about that actually can i get a little bit of feedback from you oh thanks amanda look i've got a hug oh, i could do with a real one to be honest she used to see me come in, I was absolutely shattered. It's hard work, isn't it, doing masters? Come in absolutely shattered and, and and she'd just see me and I think she's one of the only people that's been able to just grab me and hug me. So very much appreciated. Um so I think I'm I've I've kind of done unless you've got any I was going to I'm thinking about going all sciencey, but I reckon you've probably got that covered quite well from a lot of the other speakers if you're wanting more science-based and dog trainery stuff then you know i might be talked into going back and doing it again um from the more technical side but i thought that it might do you good to see it in a sort of an honest emotional way that you if you're not already there, you can get there. What you do need to do is search out people to help you get there and to, to help you find that knowledge and to tell you which books to read and to tell you which um, YouTube videos to watch and, and how to recognize when it's not a good one, you know? And I wish I'd had somebody like that. I really do. I wish I'd had a guide through my, my years. I can. Oh, can you imagine? I'd be, I'd be, I'd be an absolute torrent by now, wouldn't I? If I'd have started early and had the right um, direction, you know, I didn't do a degree. I never had a degree. I went straight into the masters. I still reckon that they just needed a grey-haired old lady um, to make up the number. All right. So thank you very much for watching. I'm sorry it's been a little bit short. Um, that's. I wanted to keep it kind of chatty i didn't want to get to make too many notes um i'm just going to have a quick look at the notes that i did make and i think no i think I've, I've, anything that i thought was going to be important is, has been said so i hope that you've enjoyed it and that you've, you've got something out of it um and thank you very much for being my own personal counselors and allowing me to talk about it Thank you very much. I've forgotten how to end the talk. <laughs> Great talk. Don't think anyone should feel guilty. We thought we were using the right methods. Yeah, absolutely. Because it was how it was done at the time. We've all learned and moved on. Um, I love this. Compassionate, truthful and enlightening. Bentley and Bear holistic dog grooming. Thank you very much. Um, Tracy McDermott, thank you, great talk. Someone's going to have to tell me. Oh, I can see the button now. I can see how to get away from you now. I can see I need to run away. Um, yeah, I think that's lovely. Uh, great talk. Yeah, brilliant. So I'm going to say goodbye. I, I think I've caught up with you. But if you want to talk to me, you just get hold of us. Just in case you, you haven't seen, um, we have a Facebook page and oh, fingers, it's called Little Tykes Dog Hub and if you message us there um, or send an email to the email address, we're on Google as well and um, you know, if I've got, I'm, I do get a bit stressy as I say, a little bit anxious so sometimes I can give quite short replies, I'm sorry it's not intended to be hurtful. Um, but I'm happy to get on Zoom and chat with people once I've got a spare moment to do that. So, thank you very much. Bye.